So studying the epistemology can deepen your understanding of knowledge and the types of beliefs that you hold. So in this lesson, we'll explore some common ways of categorizing your beliefs. A priori versus a posteriori, analytic versus synthetic, and necessary versus contingent. Studying these can deepen your epistemology, clarify your ideas, help you understand the philosophers better, like Hume and Kant, and help you discover truth. So a priori claims are those you can know independent of experience. For example, the claim that the interior angles of a triangle will always add up to 180 degrees is a priori. You don't have to measure all triangles to know this. You know it independently of or prior to experience. Here's some other examples. Bob is taller than Jane, and Jane is taller than Fred, so Bob is taller than Fred. Or here's one that's just a claim. All bachelors are unmarried. You, you don't have to look out in the world at bachelors to know that, right? So it's a priori. Whereas a priori claims seem to be justified based on pure thought or reason, a posteriori claims are justified based on experience. We can only know them after experience. So here are some a posteriori claims. The triangle is blue. Bob is over six feet tall. The boat is sinking. 60% of Americans are clinically overweight, right? So let's review. All crows are birds is a priori. All crows are black is a posteriori. Green is a color is a priori. Grass is green is a posteriori. A house is an abode for living is a priori. A house under mine will fall is a posteriori. <laughs> 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a priori, but 2 quarts of any liquid added to 2 more quarts of any liquid equal 4 quarts of liquid is a posteriori. Um, if you know something you believe it's true, I think is a priori, and I know the Earth is the third planet from the Sun is a posteriori. Okay, so that's the distinction. Let's do a practice activity. You can see it in the screen here, um, and just identify it as a priori or a posteriori. For example, number one, all bachelors are unmarried. That's a priori. Number two, it's raining in Austin, Texas right now. Well, you can only know that by looking out at the world, all right? So that's a posteriori. Number three, if today is Tuesday, then today is not Thursday. Well, I can know that just by pure thinking. So it's a priori, right? Number four, most people act self-interestedly most of the time. Well, it seems like you have to do some research and define those terms, and so that's um, a posteriori. And Batson is one guy doing research on that. Um, water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen. Hmm, that's a um, tricky one we'll look at later, but for now I'm going to say a posteriori. We discover that through science. Number six is a priori. Seven plus five equals twelve. Number seven, Thomas Jefferson once lived but now is dead. It seems that's a posteriori. Right? And you can see the rest um, and the answers below those. Okay. Now, some of these answers are controversial, and I'll explore that a bit later. Okay. But for now, let, let's focus on some other distinctions here. Um, first of all, some people get confused because we learn about triangles from math teachers and math classes. So we learn about triangles from experience. So these people, therefore, think that math should be a posteriori. Right? Now, this is a confusion between origin and method of proof. What makes something a priori is not the means by which it came to be first known, but the means by which it can be shown to be true or false. So we may need experience to furnish ourselves with the concept of a triangle, but once we have that concept, we don't need to refer to experience to determine what the properties of triangles are. A priori knowledge is thus distinguished by its method of proof, not by how we came to acquire it. That's an important distinction. So for discussion, you know, a posteriori knowledge is based on experience, but what exactly do we mean by experience? Is it scientific experience, a sensory experience, something else? Um, it's an area of controversy that we'll look at in a little bit. Discussion two, why are geometric claims like triangles have 180 degrees, why are they a priori? Well, one answer is that triangles are not real objects. They're idealized in the mind. So we live in a three-dimensional world, but triangles are two-dimensional. 
So if you look microscopically at any three-dimensional object, you'll see that it's vibrating, moving, it's wiggling, right? But two-dimensional triangles in Euclidean uh, geometry, they're perfect. So if this is right, then triangles um, can be known without looking out at the empirical world. We can think of them and know and deduce their truths without observing triangular objects out there in the world. Now, to deepen our epistemology and explore these points more rigorous, rigorously, let's turn to the next distinction, analytic versus synthetic. Okay, analytic and synthetic. So Immanuel Kant clearly explained that analytic propositions are those in which the predicate is contained in the subject. For example, when you look at the statement, all bachelors are unmarried, it's analytic because the predicate, unmarried, is contained in the subject, bachelor. So you can think of analytic statements as those that are true by definition. And here are some examples. All Texans are North Americans. All dogs are animals. Triangles have three sides. North America is in the definition of Texan. Animal, the predicate is in the definition or concept of dog. And three sides is in the concept of triangle. So notice analytic statements seem to be, they're not really truths about the world, their truths about words. The bachelor is unmarried is true because of the meaning of bachelor. Uh, you don't have to go out and look at the world to know bachelors are unmarried. So analytic propositions are what David Hume called a mere relations of ideas. They're about our words. Now synthetic statements, on the other hand, are true by experience. So the predicate is not contained in the subject. So number one, people from Texas are usually more obese than people from Colorado. Right? That's synthetic. You have to learn that from experience, not just by defining Texan. Number two, my dog is sick. Okay, again, sickness is not necessarily a part of being a dog, right? So you have to learn that from experience. It's synthetic. Number three, the triangle is red. Okay, redness is not contained. The predicate redness is not contained in the subject triangle. We have to learn that from experience about that particular triangle. So these are all synthetic statements. The predicate is not contained in the subject. They're true by experience. And scientific statements are synthetic statements. So before exploring this more deeply and looking at some controversies, let's do some practice, right? So identify these as analytic or synthetic. Number one, it's snowing right now in Colorado. Well, that's synthetic. You have to look out in the world and see if that's true. You can't just close your eyes and think about Colorado and know it's snowing, right? Okay, number two, circles are shapes. Well, that's analytic. So number one was synthetic, number two is analytic. Number three, barns are structures. Well, the predicate structures is contained in the subject barns, right? So this is an analytic statement. Number four, daisies are flowers. Well, the predicate flowers is contained in the subject daisy, so this is an analytic statement. Number five, the president is tall. Well, the predicate tall is not contained in the subject president because you could have a short president, a tall president, you know, it doesn't, you know. So um, number five is synthetic. And number six, water boils, up, boils at 100 degrees Celsius, right? Notice that the judgment about the boiling point of water goes beyond what is contained in the concept of water, right? Whereas the judgment that a bachelor is unmarried doesn't go beyond what's already contained in the concept of a bachelor. So this water boils at 100 is synthetic, and then number seven is synthetic as well. So here's a question. Are all a priori claims analytic? Well, at first it does seem that way. We could say that we know all a priori claims independently of experience because they're simply analytic claims, claims in which the predicate is contained in the subject, claims in which we're just playing with words. So a priori claims are a priori simply because they're analytic. So if you review the two practice activities that we just did, it seems like all a priori statements are analytic and all a posteriori a posteriori claims are synthetic, right? So take a moment and test that for yourself in the last two activities. If that were correct, we could say a priori and analytic claims are pretty much the same. The only difference being that a priori is about why we believe the claim, and analytic is about how the predicate of the sentence, like unmarried, is related to the subject, like bachelor. So a priori and a posteriori claims are about 
epistemology. You know, on what basis can we believe them? While analytic and synthetic claims are about language. So I know a priori claims just by thinking, but they're analytic if mere definitions make them true. So based on what we've seen so far, all a priori claims are analytic and all a posteriori claims are synthetic. However, this point and the distinctions we just learned are actually quite controversial. So let's take a moment to, to deepen our understanding here. So first, in the Critique of Pure Reason, I believe Kant clearly showed that not all a priori claims are analytic. For example, Kant believed that mathematical claim, the mathematical claim that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is synthetic a priori. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is synthetic because it does tell us about the empirical world and our intuitions of space and time are needed to fully grasp this mathematical truth. And we can test 2 plus 2 equals 4 out in the world because if you use a 2 plus 2 equals 5 math, buildings collapse and so on. So 2 plus 2 equals 4 is not a, merely a relation of ideas, yet it's a priori because we can grasp it without testing it in the world. We can grasp it just by thinking. So it seems to be synthetic a priori. So not all a priori claims are analytic. Now you can see my videos on Kant or mathematical realism for more on this. Now in the Philosopher's Toolkit, that's a, a book, Baggini and Fossil give this chart for some other controversies. Number one, let's take the claim all experience events have causes. Well Descartes thought that was analytic a priori. Hume thought that was synthetic a, a posteriori, right? And Kant thought it was synthetic a priori. Let's take the next one, 7 plus 5 equals 12. Well, Descartes and Hume thought that was analytic a priori, whereas Kant thought it was synthetic a priori. So, in short, it's controversial as to where we should draw the line and how we can combine these different distinctions, right? The debate rages on today, and understanding the points up to now will help you better understand the, these modern and as well as these older philosophers mentioned above. And it'll help you better evaluate modern epistemological claims. Now, a second objection comes from Quine. He didn't believe in a priori knowledge because all a priori claims, he thought, are in principle revisable in the light of experience. So look back at practice activity one. Do you agree with Quine that all the a priori claims listed there are revisable in the light of experience? I'm not so sure. I mean, take 2 plus 2 equals 4. Is that really revisable? There's no a priori claims? Okay, so those are some of the controversies. We're going to get into some more a little later, but let's review for a moment why these distinctions are important. The a priori, a posteriori distinction is concerned with whether any reference to experience is required in order to justify a judgment. The analytic synthetic distinction is concerned with whether thinkers add anything to concepts when they formulate their judgments thereby possibly expanding rather than simply elaborating on their knowledge. Also, crudely put, thinking through these distinctions, uh, they simply deepen your understanding of knowledge and the types of claims that are floating around in your head. Now, I'll give you a chart in a little bit to help you process this a little more clearly, but first let's do the last distinction between necessary and contingent. So necessary and contingent. A necessary truth is one that cannot be false. The denial leads to a contradiction. So here's an exam some examples. The desk is either black or not black. Cats are mammals. It's simply not possible for claims that are necessarily true to be false, and for those that are necessarily false to be true. Contingent truths, on the other hand, are those that are not necessary and whose opposite or contradiction is possible. Contingent truths could have been different. Examples, I ate a taco for breakfast. Prostate cancer is killing more people now than it did 10 years ago. The dog is on the cat's mat. It could have been the case that I ate cereal instead of a taco this morning, so that's contingent. It could have been the case that the prostate cancer went down, so that's contingent. It could have been the case that the dog was on the table instead of the mat, so that's contingent. Since it seems reasonable to believe that these could have been the case, it seems reasonable to believe those claims are contingent. If you think about it, you probably are thinking that a priori and analytic seem closely connected to necessary, while a posteriori and synthetic seem closely connected to contingent. 
and that's good. Take a look at this chart. When we talk about necessary and contingent, we're talking about metaphysics. When we talk about a priori and a posteriori, we're talking about epistemology, with whether we have to appeal to experience or not. And when we talk about analytic and synthetic, we're talking about language, with whether or not the predicate is contained in the subject. So you could kind of group them together. Group one would be necessary, a priori, analytic. Very similar, right? Group two would be contingent, a posteriori, and synthetic. Very similar. So this is a nice, clear way to think of these distinctions. But as we saw in the last section, there are controversies. Uh, remember, Kant believes some claims are synthetic a priori, so not all a priori statements are analytic. Quine and others have brought up other objections, right? So before exploring these objections and controversies, let's do a practice activity to make sure we understand necessary and contingent. Number one, it's not the case that it is raining and not raining. Well, that's necessary, right? Think back at the definition of necessary, right? It cannot be false. It's either raining or not raining, right? Necessary truths, the denial leads to a contradiction. Okay. Number two, all bachelors are unmarried. That's necessary. Number three, some men are obese. Well, that's contingent, right? Look back at contingent. Those that are, whose opposite or contradiction is possible. Well, it is possible that some men, that it's false that some men are obese, you know, in some possible world, right? Okay, number four, Napoleon won that battle. It's contingent. Number five, the cat is on the mat. It's contingent. And number six, George W. Bush was president, um, is contingent, right? So now you may have had some problems answering these. I'll go over why in just a minute. But, you know, the distinction between necessary and contingent is easy to define, but it can be difficult to apply. For example, if you're a hard determinist, then you believe every event that occurs is necessary. So in your worldview, there's no room for luck or free will if you're a determinist. So for example, number six above is necessary. George W. Bush must have been president. Events could not have been otherwise. In a deterministic universe, the result is inevitable. Um, Spinoza is an interesting philosopher who thought all events are necessary. So as a hard determinist, you might disagree with the answers that we just did in practice three. You might answer them all as necessary. Now, on the other hand, there's Quine again in his semantic holism. So he believed all of the statements we just went through are contingent because even statements like 2 plus 2 equals 4 are not necessarily true. New facts or reasons may emerge that cause us to revise our judgment that 2 plus 2 equals 4. So do you agree with him? Now, I don't, but perhaps you do. So, in short, it's easy to define contingent and necessary, but quite difficult to get agreement on which claims or events are necessary and which are contingent. Now, as a side note, you can tell a lot about a person's metaphysics or worldview based on how they think of these distinctions. For example, some philosophers get very angry with me because I agree with Kant that synthetic a priori knowledge is possible. Now, problems also arise in the philosophy of religion. So in the ontological argument, defenders present God as a necessary being because he's a being who must exist. That is, it is part of the concept of God that he necessarily exists. Now, I won't explore that here, but simply state that we need not only speak of necessary claims or events, but necessary beings. And you can see my video on the cosmological argument from con contingency for a little more on that. So again, these are simple distinctions in theory, but there's a lot of controversy about how to apply them. Some epistemologists no longer use the analytic synthetic distinction. They're influenced by Quine, though it's still useful for studying the older philosophers and deeply understanding the history of ideas and contemplating your own beliefs. Um, again, I believe it's useful to deeply understand these distinctions because it will help us more deeply understand each philosopher and the nature of our own beliefs. Now here's a chart to help you understand the distinctions we just learned, and I got this chart from Carnid's uh, YouTube channel. So under metaphysics, we have necessary and contingent. A necessary statement cannot be false. Bachelors are unmarried men. A contingent statement can be false. Bachelors are unhappy. In the next column, we have epistemology, right? 
a priori and a posteriori. A priori statements are knowable without experience. So bachelors are unmarried men, again. A posteriori are forms of knowledge that require experience. Bachelors are unhappy, okay, again. And then in the third column we have language. Remember the subject predicate stuff. And so we have analytic and synthetic. So analytic is true by definition. Bachelors are unmarried men, again. And synthetic is true by experience. Bachelors are unhappy. Now again, we've seen that these distinctions don't always line up. Not all synthetic truths are a posteriori, for example. Kant demonstrated that. Quine later questioned these associations in other ways and so on. So here's a couple of questions that will help you uh, think more deeply about this. The first one says the standard meter bar in Paris is one meter long. How would you classify? Is it necessary or contingent? Is it a priori or a posteriori? Well, the claim the standard meter bar in Paris is one meter long, this claim appears to be knowable a priori since the bar in question defines the length of the meter, of any meter. And yet it also seems that there are possible worlds in which this claim would be false. You know, worlds in which the meter bar is damaged or exposed to extreme heat. So is it a priori and contingent? Or consider this one from Kripke. I like Kripke a lot. He says, water is H2O. Well, the statement seems necessary, but also a posteriori, right? Think about that for a moment. Is it necessary and a posteriori? So not all necessary claims are a priori? It's also interesting to note that Quine is a materialist, but Kripke is not. Does this influence their logical systems, or vice versa, or both? For more logic and epistemology, uh, visit my website, lucidphilosophy.com, or the logic course on YouTube. Thanks for listening. <clears throat>